The question is asked of me, and the question is asked of you, when you hear the voice within you say, Thou art my begotten Son, what do you think? Where does that take you? And as you dwell with that, you may discover that it is not a statement about you alone. That whatever you hear within is a statement about everyone else as well. And when the master heard within himself the words of the father, these words were accepted as the truth of everyone who appeared before him. As the momentity of this dawns upon us, we learn to accept that every word spoken within him and through him is the truth of us and every word spoken within and through us is the truth of everyone else. When you hear that you are the begotten Son, the next person who appears before you is also that begotten Son, simply not hearing the word that you have heard does not change the fact that he or she is. And so as he spoke to Pharisees, it made no difference. They were the begotten son, just as he was. He was speaking to a divided mind that could not perceive the truth. But nonetheless, the truth could not change. I, in the midst of thee, could never leave even a Pharisee. I and the Father are one is the truth of those who at the moment are in prisons, asylums, cemeteries. It makes no difference who and where an individual is or what he is demonstrating, I, in the midst of that individual and the Father, are one. The unsuspecting human mind, hearing fourth dimensional truth, is baffled by it. It's a strange new order of truth, and so the unsuspecting mind must reject it. It has no way of connecting with it, understanding it, or putting it to use. It never even recognizes the relationship of the new truth with itself. And so it remains a Pharisee. The Master does miracles. And the Pharisee says, Are you really the Christ? The spirit within you reveals the perfection of being and the mind of you says, can I really trust this to be so? I know it happened yesterday, but what assurance do I have that it will happen again tomorrow? The Pharisee and the Christ, the mind and its material creation and the soul. You see before you the drama, the conflict, the ignorance that leads to fear, the fear that leads to violence. Always I and the Father are one regardless of where the mind sits. Now beside you, is there another self? 
Where can you find God if not in yourself? If we cannot find God within ourselves, we can never find God. For I in the midst of thee am God. You cannot find God outside. And so the Master came to reveal to us that only through conscious contact with our source within are we one with God. And the magic and the miracle was not the healing accomplished here or there by him, but the fact that Christ within performed the miracles. The fact that Christ in you performs the miracles, this is the miracle. Conscious contact with source is the key to divine living. One with the Father. One with the I in the midst of you is the secret of attunement with the infinite. I in the midst of you am mighty. When you have found I in the midst of you, I go to the Father, for I and the Father are one. And so when, when you have found I in the midst of you, you are one with the infinite. I in you is consciousness, divine. The Father is infinite consciousness. Divine consciousness in you is one with infinite consciousness and you are tuned to your source. But more than that, I in the midst of everyone you know is divine consciousness. And that doesn't change because an individual is ignorant of it. So when you are tuned to I in the midst of you, which is one with the infinite Father, the infinite Father being one with I in the midst of everyone else, whether they know it or not, you are instantly one with everyone else. You are tuned to the I of your being, and the Father is tuned to the I of everyone, and therefore you are tuned to the I of everyone when you have found I in the midst of you. Conscious contact with your source is conscious contact with every one and everything in the spiritual universe. And when you live there, you have found your inner sanctuary. You are sipping the wine of spirit, supping at the table of divine bread. And this is the network of oneness through which the infinite flows gracing your household. This is how we're all learning to be a channel for the great outflow of light. It is our function to keep opening up this channel, removing every blockade, every division, every inner concept which does not conform to the truth of being, until we are transparent until I in the midst of me, I in the midst of you, are consciously one. Until the ten righteous men are expanded into ten million. Now that's the key to the Master's statement that I and the Father are one. I, divine consciousness, and the outer expression of the infinite consciousness without interruption. Of mine own self I do nothing. The Father within the infinite does all the work, for the infinite is greater than the individual, although they are one continuous expression. And that which I 
the master appearing on earth as Christ Jesus say to the Pharisees I the master within you am saying to I in the midst of you and the father of one and beside I in the midst of you and the father who are one there is no other there is no God and you there is no I and you there is only I which is your name in this momentous statement the master tore apart the veil of mortality the Pharisees could not understand his activity on earth for in their level of mind the human level there is no capacity to comprehend the infinite invisible there is no capacity to walk in God's creation there is no capacity to live under grace to experience the qualities of God and so the complete spiritual universe remained unknown men thought they would die and go to heaven today we're just as blind living in the myth of a mortal selfhood ignorant of I in the midst of me as identity we walk locked out of the spiritual universe adrift separated seeking wondering asking striving and here it is where you are I the divine I is your only self now if we still live in a human mind we're going to be like the Pharisees and we're going to say well I need more proof no matter how much proof we get we're going to continue in the belief that unless we get more proof there's nothing much we can do about this ridiculous statement that there is a divine I which is my name and identity and so a corner of our mind will keep functioning on the mortal level even saying I'm on the human plane I've got to do certain things on the human plane now let's cut that away the divine eye knows no second that you on the human plane is not the divine eye there is the divine eye and there is no other there is no end there's no divine eye and a human plane that's living back in the days of the Pharisees the only eye there is is the eye of God in you I in you is God I in your neighbor is God and God is all there's not God and I in the midst of each is God and we are humble to I in the midst of ourselves in the midst of our neighbors and this puts us in the infinite network of spirit where we learn to live by trust with no images in thought we've all been fouled up by these images in thought I in the midst of you is there functioning if you do not have the experience of I in the midst of you functioning it is because images in your thought have blocked out that experience 
By images and thought, we mean every thought. Not just what you would like to see, but what you think you have seen. By what you think is here. Remember, there have been many strange statements in the chapter no end. We have been told by Joel that if you see a good, healthy, young person walking down the street, you're being hypnotized, just as much as if you see a sick person in a hospital. Now, that's a strange statement, and if we don't face the consequences of it, we're still thinking there's an infinite eye somewhere, and maybe a divine eye in that individual there, but there's also a person there. And we're not getting the benefit of the great revelation of truth that I in the midst of you is God. I in the midst of the prisoner is God. I in the midst of every one is God. And that self of you which cannot cleave to the inner truth of an individual that there, invisible to my human sense, is I, God, that self of you is a false self. For the self that does not recognize and accept I as God in the midst of everyone, that self is not a real self at all. That self is the dreaming self. Now, as you hold I in the midst of you, in the midst of your neighbor, as God, if you were to go and seek something from your neighbor now, or want something, or need something, what you would be saying is that I in the midst of you is not omnipotent, is not omniscient is not omnipresent and that because I in the midst of you cannot do what you would like it to do you are seeking and striving to attain things and you are denying that I in the midst of you and the Father are one you're going to hear much about that statement for the next 20 years for the simple reason that it is the key to the kingdom. When you know that I in the midst of you is selfhood, that I and the Father are one, when you understand it, when you accept it, when you live by it, you will see why an image in thought is a denial of that statement. Is not the Father all power, all presence, all intelligence? Is not the Father the only substance? And if the Father is I in the midst of you, what is there for you to do? But be still and let the light of the Father form itself as your living experience. You rest as the sun, quietly, shining. And you let the Father shine through you. That's all you do. Of your own human self, you do nothing because you learn there is no human self there. You shine like the sun. You simply shine not with images and thought, not with plans, not with purposes, 
but to let the light of the Father in you shine. And the word trust is how you multiply the Lord. Shine, Father. There is no density of thought here, no opacity. There is no thought here to bar the way of the true, pure experience of life. So great is your trust that you take absolutely no thought, for the Father knoweth. Not only your needs, but the needs of the universe. The Father is performing. How dare we think the Father is not performing? And if the Father is performing, what more is there to do? But find this great center of rest where you can say the Father, the infinite Father through the eye of my being is functioning as the living Christ. The Father is expressing. The Father is outpouring love everywhere. Right now, nothing can stop it. We can only keep ourselves out of the experience of it by images and thought. When you are pure in thought, pure at heart, completely open, accepting, knowing, believing. The infinite sun is shining through you as the experience of God living its life as you. I and the Father, one life, one action, one being, one substance, one harmonious expression of divine love. Do you make it so? Never. It is always being so. But when you dart in and out of thought, you turn away from that divine infinite flow of love and you wonder where it is. It's right there in the midst of you. Every deed on earth by Christ Jesus was divine love manifesting as that which we called the outer healing or the outer miracle. But it wasn't just then, it is now. It is now for everyone who accepts I and the Father are one. So unchanging is this truth that it's only a matter of human sense of time before it becomes the living way of every individual on this earth. It can never change. And as you dwell with it, as you face it courageously and accept the consequences of the fact that I and the Father are one, you learn to turn away from all that declares that I and the Father are two. Can you be two if you are one? Can there be God and you if you and the Father are one? And if you are that I which is one with the Father, can you be different than the Father? Is the Father mortal? Is the Father made of bones? Is the Father living a limited lifespan? I and the Father are immortal. I and the Father are living an eternal life, a permanent life. I and the Father can never die. I and the Father can never reincarnate. I and the Father can never know pain or hurt. 
I and the Father can never know darkness or poverty or famine. I and the Father are one. And all that is not that one has no existence except in the limited sense mind of man. There is no mortal, there is no finitude, there is no dying material self. There is I, and I am come, and I do stand at the door of your consciousness, and I do knock. And when you courageously open the door of your consciousness to this I, which is yourself, heaven ceases to be the invisible universe, spirit ceases to be the invisible universe, and the great truth hidden from all the ages of human minds is revealed that I, in the midst of you am God, and I am your only identity. I'll open out a way and let me shine through as your daily life practice the knowledge that I in the midst of you am come. I am the power of God in you. I am the harmony of God. I am the truth of God. I am the love of God. I am all that God is, and I am come in the midst of you. I am the infinite individualization called Christ. And wherever you look, whoever you see, it is I. And I am love. And therefore, no matter what you see, only I, love, am there. Be not fooled by the appearances. The I love that is the center of your being is the I love that is the center of all being. For there is no second. There is no second self anywhere. It is I. Be not afraid. And when you accept that it is I, and that I and the Father are one, you have found the spiritual universe and you can rest confidently anchored in the truth that I is come everywhere without second and I am the harmony of weather I am the harmony of the tides I am the harmony of the universe but you must walk in I, consciously. You must be consciously one with I. Twenty-four hours a day, I am your identity. Twenty-four hours a day, I am one with the Father. Before the form, I am one with the Father. After the form, I am one with the Father. I am eternally one with the Father, and I am eternally the identity that you are. Now, if you were called upon then to serve some person across the street in another home in another city where would you go you would go to the I of your own being because I in the midst of you 
is one with the Father. And that's how you find the Father. You wouldn't project your thought to that other person's home because if you did, you would discover it's of no value. You go to the Father, but the Father is I in the midst of you. And the Father is I in the midst of that other individual. When you go to the Father within you, through I, you touch the Father who is I in the midst of that other individual. And that is how you find that other individual. It is I. Always the work begins in you, in your being, in your recognition that your being is I. And then you have touched anyone in the universe who has opened up to you. You have touched the spiritual reality of even those who have not opened up to you. But when they open to you, then the spiritual reality which you have touched flows through them and they receive the light which they have sought. Now that should become very clear to us that our harmony, our expression of divinity on earth, depends completely on living in the eye of our own being, knowing that eye is the same eye that is in all and is one with the Father, so that we are not only connected to the infinite, but to every individual, whether or not that individual is knowingly aware of the truth. The truth remains steadfast, eternal. And this is how you are prepared for the transitional experience. The human mind has no capacity to build toward the transitional experience. All it can do is stand in the way of I. And so when you are preparing for your day of transition, for that moment when form is no longer needed as we know it, you are preparing by letting I do the work. Letting I go before you. Letting I guide you, lead you, feed you, sustain you open you, letting I prepare tables in the wilderness of the human mind. Only I can do it. Only I am the way. And I move aside all stones, all barriers. I dissolve all error. I dehypnotize the human mind. I reveal the present hidden treasure of reality. Do not try to do it with your human mind. Go to I and surrender. Rest in I and I will do the work. I am the way. I who walked among the Pharisees was not recognized. But we are no longer Pharisees. We are disciples. We follow the master of I within. And we rest with trust that I is the way. I is the self, and beside I there is no other, not even Pilate, not even Herod. There is no enemy to I, for where the enemy appears to be, it is not an enemy. It is the invisible I. Everywhere is I. Everywhere is self. Everywhere is one divine life. And only the eye of your being can take you through this one divine life to the transitional experience. No.
no end. The human mind cannot follow that instruction because it is the end. And the complete creation of the human mind is the end. It is the stone that must be removed, rolled away. Only I know there is no end. And therefore, the complete so-called mortal experience is handled by living in I. I is immortal. I is without error. I is without second powers to oppose it. And in I, you walk through the mortal mist, through the flame, untouched, for no error can kindle upon the consciousness of I and the Father of One. I felt that today our ten righteous men would show themselves gathered in one eye. Some of you are leaving the country. One student has gone to England. Two of you are going to the Netherlands. Others will go here and others will go there. And in five years, there's no telling where many of us will be. All over the world. But one thing we can do is let I go before us. No matter where we go, we can be the living truth that I in the midst of me is mighty because it is God. And you need not speak of it. The emanation of I speaks for itself. The emanation of I attracts its household wherever you go and does the works, illuminates, educates, raises up, heals the sick, removes the myth of mortality which is raising the dead. Now, I in the midst of you is the resurrection. Out of all of the limitations of mortality. I in the midst of you know no impossible things. Every human error is dissolved by the light of I. Effortlessly there's no might or muscle. There's no mental striving. That which does not exist is revealed as non-existence by that which does exist. And so what I'm urging upon you is to spend more of your concentrated time and effort in the realization that until you have developed the capacity to know I in the midst of you by coming into a cosmic rest, a deep silence, a total personal humility to I where you are, until you have done that you will be chasing in the wrong direction after words of truth that have no power. Beyond these words, beyond all your thoughts, the experience of I reveals that I alone can do all the things that the world has been seeking to do. That must be your direction. And the fruits of it are quick, sharp, and powerful. This past week, I've just about had every case in the book 
There have been at least 20 of them. All types. And everyone was in a sense saying, I have not found the eye of my own being. And yet that was the answer to everyone. The knowledge that I, right here, in the midst of my being, is God, is the answer. It doesn't matter what you think is wrong, that's the answer. I, right here where you are, in the midst of your being, is God. Can there be a greater miracle than that? Is it a wonder that Joel tells us when we know this truth, we need no other? There is no other truth. That is the truth you must know that makes you free. I, in the midst of your being, is God. When? Now, this very second and forever. And you do not have to deserve it. You can be the worst sinner in the world. Nothing can change that relationship. I, in the midst of your being, is God. If I is God, and there's no God and, who are you? Every error, every claim, every problem is nothing more than a denial that I, in the midst of you, is God. In our ignorance of this, We get lost in the mazes of the mind. We fall from the truth. We go right back into the myth of a mortal me in a material body that dies, completely unaware that where I stand is my immortal self, the only self I can ever be. You see why hypnotism, suggestion, mortal mind, appearances have fooled us all into thinking there is something beside God? Do you see why Joel says when you see a healthy young person walking down the street, You're just as hypnotized as when you see a sick one. All that's there is I. And because the human mind cannot see that or know that or hold that truth, you must enter the cosmic rest. Be centered in that infinite silence which enables I to appear in your experience and to dehypnotize the human mind. Now this takes practice, practice, practice. And there's nothing you could practice that would be more beneficial to you than to sit in the quiet of your meditation and invite I to present itself. (coughs) To take you out of the mental universe which is not one with the Father. Right here, now, where your five senses seem to be, 
is another self. Instead of trying to improve the qualities or relationships or status of this self, the Christ message is come into the self that already is the perfection of the Father. Instead of improving the old self, we are told to be transformed and to live in the real self. How different. Come out of her. Come out of this old self that never was. And where you stand, know that God is. Right where you stand, God is. And the name of God where God is, where you stand, is I. And that I is you. That's yourself. That's yourself before form and after form. That's yourself that is forever. That's your permanent self. That's not your reincarnating self. That's not your self of flesh and blood. That's not your self who goes through the trials and tribulations of being a human being. That's not yourself who returns to dust. And that's not yourself that's going to go to heaven either. That self is in heaven here and now. That self has no boundaries, no limitations. That self has no age. That self is free, unbounded and present waiting to be lived in as your own being. You have no other self. You can continue to walk in the belief of another self, but that other self will always discover that it is not sustained by the Father, for the Father is only one with I. The Father directs I. The Father expresses through I. The Father lives as I. The Father lives as the I of your parent and your child. The Father lives as the I of everyone you know. And if you would know them as they are, you must know I in you. And then you will know I in them is that very self-same I. When you meditate upon this, you're inviting the Father to reveal the nature of I, the presence of I, the glory of I, and then to multiply the qualities of I into experience. You're saying, Christ, live my life. For me of mine own self can do nothing. You're saying, I believe in the Christ of God where I stand as I. And because this I is my being, there is nothing that I need defend against, attack, react to, seek or strive to attain. I in the midst of me is the fullness, the wholeness, the entirety of God expressing here and now. Whatever it needs, it has within itself. It is supply. It is truth. It is power. It is substance. And it manifests itself as divine form. The fountain of living waters is I. And when you're living in the conscious awareness of I, you are living your eternal life. You are living your fourth dimensional self. A 
and you are free of every false power in this world. There is only I, and beside I, where you stand, the invisible spirit of God, there is no mortal self. Be transformed. The adjustment is in consciousness. You shift out of one false sense of consciousness into the acceptance of the true. Until I within you declares itself and you know your name, your identity, your oneness with the infinite Father, your omnipotence, you know that wherever you are does not depend on where your form happens to be. For I am omnipresence. I do not depend on where your form happens to be. This shift in consciousness is facing the consequences of the revelation that I and the Father are one. You might call it becoming soul adjusted. It's the preparation for resting in oneness for every day that we will move through until the transitional moment resting in oneness this inner rest in oneness does not preclude outer activity but it becomes the channel through which outer activity is divined is sustained is part of the one purpose and it removes all sense of separation in the various conscious and unconscious levels of the human mind this is your conscious attunement to the infinite self it is the way of the Christ It does the mighty works as of old. It will answer every need before you ask if you will rest there. Instead of leaning on the human sense, the human understanding, the human solution. These are all revealed as solutions made of straw You see, we have no capacity to dehypnotize ourselves. We've tried it. It doesn't work. Only I can do it. Only I, in the midst of you, can break the barriers of hypnosis. The human mind cannot dehypnotize itself. And you and I have learned that you can walk in this path with total dedication 
and yet be walking in the wrong direction. It's a fantastic thing. You can put all you've got into it and yet walk in the wrong direction because the human mind will constantly lay before you a path of roses that turn out to be thorns. Unless you're in I, you're always in a state of self-deception. Because only I is reality. I think that's a fairly good beginning for what we have to do today. We're moving into a level now where oneness realized is going to be our normal consciousness. And each week we will strengthen the work we have done individually during the week, rising in the conscious realization of that oneness to the point where I is the level of consciousness of this class. And then wherever you go, if this is your consciousness, I will go before you. I will prepare mansions for you. I will remove all of the thorns in every pathway. I will provide. I will teach you while the form is asleep. I will take you into the invisible. I will introduce you to the saints and the sages of all ages. I will lead you through your father's universe, not the most believe one of the human mind. But you must stay in I for I alone am tuned to the infinity of source. One with source, one with the infinite, is the way of our path, and this must be a conscious activity. Ten, twenty, thirty times a day, if only for ten seconds, you are consciously knowing the presence of I where you stand is the presence of I where everyone else is. Whether it's a rattlesnake or an elephant or a person, the presence of I is all that is there, all that is here. And it is all the I that I am. You've translated everything back to the essence of being, out of the forms into the essence called I. One indivisible I essence. Later we hope to restress no images and thoughts because that is a second self. Suppose we take a short recess now and then go back to the Master in chapter 10 or 11, wherever we happen to be.
please try now to understand that the eye of your being is the same eye that is going through the experience here in Bible of walking among what are called Pharisees that when I speaks here to the Pharisees it is the eye of your being there's no time lapse there's just I speaking I have said many strange things to the mind of man and the mind of man called here the Pharisee is unable to comprehend my meaning because it has no capacity in the Pharisee mind to receive the word of spirit and so its actions must be strange it must react there was a division therefore again among the Jews for these sayings many of them said he has a devil and is made and is mad why hear ye him now then I is speaking to the Pharisee mind and the mind says I which is one with the father is mad and has a devil that is the revelation that the human mind has no capacity to hear the voice of God for I am the voice of God I in the midst of you am the life of God the voice of God the power of God and I speak to the mind of you which says I do not believe what I hear that must be the devil and this is what has been taking place in the human consciousness all these years the human mind turning away has said that must be the devil it has been saying that to all the inner stirrings of the soul while pretending to itself how righteous it is how noble how benevolent how charitable it is turning away from I others said these are not the words of him that hath a devil can a devil open the eyes of the blind and so the human mind is capable of two observations it can see the evil or the good on the material plane could a devil open the eyes of the blind that sees the good and the other side of the same mind sees the evil the revelation then is that the human mind itself is a state of division into good and evil good matter bad matter good conditions bad conditions but it can never see one it always sees the opposites the two and so the master the eye of you is revealing that your human mind is divided it sees the good and the evil of the material world but not further than that it does not see the spiritual universe of the eye and so it is always struggling to change the bad to the good because it believes the good is real and the bad is not but I reveal unto you that there is no evil matter and no good matter there is only I 
invisible spirit where you see good and evil matter. So the opening of the consciousness to this spiritual perfection where the human mind sees good and bad is part of the purpose at this moment. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple, in Solomon's porch. Now when Jesus walks in the temple, this is the same temple that he spoke of when he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. They're all walking in a physical temple. He's walking in an invisible temple because he has some there who are following him. He has disciples there, those who can discern. He is revealing the temple not made with hands. That temple which is the body of the soul. He is teaching those who can follow who can accept these first fruits of his work, that I in the midst of thee am mighty. I in the midst of thee am life, not death. I am the body without beginning or end. I am the body of you. When you know me, you will live in this body. And he walks in this body of the soul, in Solomon's porch. You remember, in a little fishing town of Bethesda, there was a healing of a cripple. And by that sheep market, there were five porches. They were in Solomon's porches. They were the five porches of the senses in which all of the ills of the world are. But this is a different porch. This is Solomon's porch. As contrasted with the five senses or five porches of the human consciousness. Solomon's porch then is the great light of reality. He walked in his soul body in reality. And there were those there who could know this. For this walking in his soul body, in reality, Solomon's porch, is also a state, a statement about the spiritual capacity of those who were following him. <coughs> there were men on earth of that day and women who could understand who could follow him into the invisible self. How? They did precisely what we're learning to do, to live as I, the Spirit of God which is one with the Father. And let I open up the inner vision. Let I illuminate. Let I reveal the body of the soul. Let I reveal the incorporeal nature of being. And so let's pretend for a moment that we can walk with him in I, in the temple in Solomon's porch. And we can see why the Pharisees who cannot are so bewildered for they're walking in dying bodies of clay, which we are learning to renounce as not created by the Father. Then came the Jews round, said unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt? If thou be the Christ, say it plainly. 
No man can say I am the Christ. No out of person can say I am the Christ. The only where place you will ever hear I am the Christ is within yourself. Only within you will the Christ proclaim itself. The mind looks out for the Christ, not in. And of course, misses the God experience. While thinking it's worshiping God. Because the Father only speaks to Christ within. Jesus answered them, and this is when we must learn to listen inside ourselves. Not like a Pharisee talking to Jesus out there. Because it's the Pharisee mind of us which is asking these questions, and we must learn to hear the answer not out there but inside ourselves as the inner eye of you says that which Christ responds to the Pharisee. In you must come the words, I, I told you, and ye believe not. The works I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Have you seen any I miracles performed in your life? They came from I in the midst of you, not from a person, not from a practitioner. All any other individual did was die to self, let the I of his own being touch the I of you, and the I of you released you. And the I of you is telling you that right now in these words. I told you, and ye believed not the works that I do in my Father's name. You see that? That's the I of you, which is always the liberator from your so-called Pharisaic or mortal mind. You have never been healed by a person of anything. Only I in the midst of you, touched in some way, does the releasing from the illusion of something that had to be healed. And if you had been in the eye, you would have not needed that so-called healing. Are we getting somewhere now? Always I in the midst of you am your practitioner. I in the midst of you am one with the Father. Is there any more? Do you see how beautiful this is? Suppose a whole herd of cattle had a disease. I, in the midst of every one of that herd, I am God. I, in the midst of you, I am God. Rest in I, and I will reveal the non-reality of disease. Suppose you come into complications with the younger ones, these sweet 18-year-olds, falling in love and out of love every third week. And oh, horror of horrors, she's going out now with a married man. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to throw her out? Are you going to argue? Are you going to make demands? Try it and see how far it gets you. You'll have to get a padlock. It won't work. But go to I. Isn't I the eye of the married man? Isn't I the eye of the 18-year-old? Isn't I the eye of you? Do we have the right to make human judgments when I alone knows the will of the Father, when I am the only presence and the only power and the only life. Do you see we have our Aladdin's lamp? We have the key. 
it doesn't matter what forms the problems take. Maybe tomorrow they're going to elope and you don't think they're ready. How many parents have taken the human steps and found that it only leads to disaster? Out of this frying pan into that one. But suppose you found I. Am I not love? Can love bring disaster? Am I not peace? Am I not harmony? Am I not the infinite mind? Can you not trust me? Am I not the mind of all? When you touch I and you, you touch the infinite mind. And the infinite mind is the mind of every individual in I. And though they know it not, what difference does it make? Is not God the center of everyone, whether they know it or not? You have the key, but you must rest there. And so again and again and again the words strike back and say, I have told you so before, but you did not hear me. You were in that three-dimensional consciousness that could hear the words without seeing their relationship to your being. Because you didn't know that I, who speak these words, am the self of everyone who walks the earth. I'm not a man speaking to Pharisees in the Bible 2,000 years ago. I'm the eye of the universe. The soul of everyone who walks. The truth of all being. Present everywhere. Whether they know me or not, I am there and there is no other. And when you have this precious truth within yourself realized, consciously practicing it, you have the keys to the kingdom of reality, of harmony, of grace, of beauty, of life, expressing the perfection of the divine. And then you don't make decisions because that's an image in thought. You let I, in the midst of you, her, him, be the deciding mind as you rest in trust that I know thy needs. I am the expression of the divine will. I am the truth. And I am the life rest in me and I will reveal the Father's work on earth not just for broken bones but for all so-called human activity that concerneth thee and this I has been saying this to us before Abraham longer than the Bible has been written I have been speaking to you And now we're turning to that eye, listening, believing. We're finally coming to the place where Christ walking through Jerusalem is the eye of my own being, finally opening me up to an understanding of what Christ on earth was doing. Infiltrating consciousness everywhere to show the power of the Father on earth was available, present, ready. We didn't have to wait and do not have to wait for a death experience to lift us up to a mythical heaven. I am come. But ye believe not. 
because ye are not of my sheep as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. All those who listen within to their own being, which is I, are the sheep. And they hear the voice, and they are able to follow I. They're not living in the external world of the senses. They have found the secret of life is the inner experience of I. And I give unto them eternal life. This is God speaking on earth. I give unto them eternal life. The Father is I in the midst of you, saying, I give ev everyone who listens, who lives as and in I within eternal life. There's no room for doubt. There's no room for mistaking it. That's the state. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. When you have found I in you, you cannot be plucked out of the infinite. You cannot perish. There's no you left to perish because you know yourself to be I. And that means no power on earth can pluck you out. No power on earth can change this relationship. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. Your identity says that the infinite Father is the only power, greater than all. There's no second to vie against the infinite self when you are standing in the eye of your being. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. This is the statement of the omnipotence of I and you, which ultimately enables you to hear, I am the only power on the earth. Over all things, flood, fire, mountain, avalanche, famine, poverty, over and under population, you name it, I am the only power. No man can pluck you out of my hand. For the infinite Father sustains I. In all things, my grace is thy sufficiency. This is how dehypnosis comes about. Not by us sitting down to figure out what to do, but by letting I take over. Then we're dehypnotized from the five porches of the mind, the senses. We sit in Solomon's porch. And soon we become conscious of the inner temple or soul body as a reality. We see how the mortal body is a mental counterfeit of this soul body as a reality as an experience, as a practical way of life, no longer conjecture or a promise, but a fact realized and lived in. That is why he could say earlier, 
I lay down my life that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received from the Father. That soul body, you can walk out into it and walk back into the appearance of a physical body. To the mind of man incomprehensible but I say unto you these words are said by I that's our authority that's the way we move in spiritual progression not limited by what the human mind can understand but by the authority of I the father within then we are no longer stagnating trying to improve a mortal self but accepting the commandment be transformed and the way is provided by I for I my father are one your assignment for the week if you will accept it as one is to take I and my father are one and learn how to accept it as the permanent fact of your existence Meditate with it, commune with it. Whatever you read, weigh it from the standpoint of I and my Father of one. But above all, practice it. Live it out. Don't let it be five or six words in your mind. Live it out. I hear and my father are one but this isn't said to me alone this is said to Johnny and Harry and Billy and Mary and Genevieve I and my father are one I is in the midst of each one accept it for the world not just your human self and live in that acceptance for that's where the power is I in the midst of Genevieve, I in the midst of Harry, I in the midst of Richard, I in the midst of everyone is the divine self that I am. Don't blot me out of this one because you'll blot me out of yourself. Try to find an acceptance within you that only I is where that person appears where every thing and every one appears substitute I is there and I and the father of one and you begin to know your spiritual universe as a living vibrating present reality Forms will not fool I, but they will fool the mind. If you don't do this, you will be doing the next line in the Bible. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. That's the equivalent of saying, I don't believe a word of it this isn't for me we stone the truth we really stone I
You either practice I or you stone I. You notice many, many times through the Bible they're always throwing stones at Christ. Why? The same reason you and I have done it every day. When we make a human decision, we stone the Christ. When we accept Christ, Christ makes the decisions. I, in the midst of us, makes the decisions. But I is you. You're not turning to a second self. You're leaving the false sense of self. I is you. And it's come to that place and time where the only way we can honor the Father is to be I. For only the Son can honor the Father. It's come to that place where we can no longer even pretend to ourselves. We either honor the Father by accepting I as my name and identity and listening to I and following I and believing in the power of I to be the infinite self on earth with total trust, confidence and finally discover this is our great opportunity to watch the infinite express itself as the I that I am. We begin to feel the joy of this great promise. It ceases to be a task or an obligation or a responsibility, it's the way of life. It's life expressing. And I can accept this infinite life expression or stone it by forgetting it, turning away from it, denying it, rejecting it, or even accepting it only partially. And so limit myself to the divided three-dimensional mind. So I repeat, this week, I and the Father are one, is our assignment. once you make it your real assignment you'll discover it's your permanent assignment every day of your life it's the way you have to learn to live Jesus answered them many good works have I showed you from my father which of these works for which of these works do you stone me now, isn't this a fascinating thing? Can you think of one evil work that Jesus Christ did on earth? One evil work? Not one. They were all good works. Why? Because they were all ordained and expressed out of love and out of wisdom by the I which is one with the Father, which is the expression of God. All perfect works. And therefore, why should the mind turn away? For which of my good works do you stone me? And so he's saying that when you look out of a human mind, you cannot recognize good works. You think they're evil because a human mind is predisposed to see evil. Evil will see evil. He's saying to them and to us, examine your motives again, please. These are perfect works. How can you stone them? The fact that you do is not a reflection on the works, but upon your inadequate level of consciousness, which cannot perceive that these are perfect works of God. Translated into our modern idiom, 
how can we possibly turn away from I within when we know the meaning of I that can only do perfect works what form of insanity would prevent us not from living in I would prevent us from living in the conscious awareness that when I live in I I'm in conscious union with the infinite father we'd have to be totally unwilling totally misunderstanding totally ignorant of truth in order to continue in a way that would say to I depart from hence this mortal mind of mine is going to continue living my life well thank heaven those days are over we have lived in those dark days of the mind but the light of I is upon us within each one we have even outlived the question asked by I because now we're learning not to stone my own identity I've really stoned the solution to all the problems I thought I had. You see how twisted and deformed the human mind has been? It has been casting stones at its own solutions for problems that it couldn't solve. Of course we've been hypnotized. Who else would do that but a hypnotized one? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, being a man, makes thyself God. That's what they saw there, a man. They saw a man because they were looking out of the eyes of a man. A man sees a man. They saw a man like themselves because they had not found I in the midst of them. But Christ wouldn't let them stop at that level. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods? You find that in the Psalms. I said ye are gods. Well, that's in your law. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scriptures cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent unto the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God, you see here these Pharisees the human mind has been talking quite a lot about God but when it's faced with God it can't believe it it simply can't believe such a thing can happen God is up there everybody knows that there's no God on earth how could this man be God how ridiculous and how egotistical this is blasphemy but who's saying this is blasphemy? That mind, which is not the Christ mind. That mind which loves to talk about God. That mind which inflates itself with its own importance. But then when I, God, appear, that mind is totally blind. I, God, appeared on earth. And the greatest religion of the day looked at I, God, and said, We don't see you at all. You're not there. You're just a man. 
But it wasn't a man, it was I. And it's the same I that is knocking at the door of every person, even this moment. I'm not a man. I'm I. I'm the infinite spirit of God in you. And what I am doing now is what I was doing there in that day. Don't stone me. Give me to drink. Accept me. Open your consciousness. Crucify the Pharisaic mind, not the Christ. And you will bear fruit richly. name is I, your identity is I, your substance is I, and be still and know that I am God. Let the stillness be a permanent way an inner silence facing outer appearances with the knowledge that I in the midst of me is God. Nothing can change this eternal relationship. Neither life nor death can separate me from the I, the love of God. And so I can face all outer experiences all out of conditions with the knowledge that I in the midst of me is not bound by the outer conditions. I in me is not under karma. I in me is not controlled by weather, sin, disease, limitation. Rest in I. And all of the mountains outside will dissolve. Nothing can stand that isn't real in the presence of I realize. Because I realized is infinity right here and now functioning as the perfect self of God. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. There's the test. Don't believe the man. Believe the works. Because the works attest to the presence of I. What man makes the waves go down? What man heals the cripple? What man brings manna from heaven? Only I. If you don't believe in me, believe in the works because the works show you that I am the Son of God. And that I which is the Son of God which does the works is your identity. Give your identity an opportunity to demonstrate the works and the man will get out of the way and then as the works are done, you will know. I am your identity, for no man can do these works, only I can. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. He went away beyond the Jordan into that place where John had first baptized and where he abode. Many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of the man were true. Many believed on him there.
Either you accept I here in you now or I returns to the Jordan, meaning you lose the awareness of I for a while, begins all over again, running a cycle of training through to the point where it comes to the pinnacle of acceptance or rejection and then begins all over again. It's really previewing the cycle of reincarnation. When you reject I, you're setting the stage for your own return to a mortal body. Starting back at the beginning. Now there are many lessons here. Without these lessons, that I in the midst of the Almighty and I am the only, beside I there is no other, we never have a real understanding of what is to follow. And what is to follow is going to reinforce our understanding of what has preceded. Now the eye of your being is going to stand at Lazarus's tomb. And the eye of your being is going to be in Lazarus's tomb. And the eye of your being is going to demonstrate the meaning of believe on the works, for no man can do these things and I who do these things am your being. You can look ahead now to the next chapter, Resting in Oneness. You can look ahead to the 11th chapter of John, which is the resurrection of Lazarus. But when you look ahead to these things, Ask the eye of you what this has to do with you. How does the resurrection of Lazarus have anything to do with you? Or is it possible that Lazarus is a symbol of your mortal self being raised from the tomb? Think on these things dwelling with I and the Father of One. And remember when we stand before the tomb that I and the Father of One is the principle that will be revealed as the liberation of he who dwells in a body of clay. The chapter we have been studying for four or five weeks is entitled No End. If you are I and there is no end, there's not a second you. There's only I, the spirit. The mortal material self is Lazarus in the tomb. But there is no mortal material self and so I step out of the tomb because there's one standing before the tomb who knows that I and the Father are one. The message for us is what is important. You'll find the answer in the chapter, No End, which you have been reading, and in the chapter, Resting in Oneness, which is our fifth chapter, I think, and the next chapter. But all these chapters are about your being, yourself. They're not chapters in a book. They're the word of I expressing, leading, teaching, inspiring, confidence that you actually can walk in a world living in identity knowing that every need is provided for by the infinite invisible through the eye of your being
It hasn't provided for you before because you weren't living in the eye of your being. And when you did, you found the sustenance of grace appearing on the doorstep, unannounced. Oneness. Infinite I. Is the eye of Jesus and the eye of Joel one? It must be. Is the eye of Jesus and the eye of you one? It must be. Is the eye of Joel and the eye of you one? It must be, whether you know it or not. The difference then is in knowing it. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In the knowing, which means the conscious awareness of it, the miracle of I becomes the daily activity of your consciousness. Your consciousness imbued with the knowledge of I, which is truth, becomes a law of permanent freedom. In our meditation now, consciously know the eye of Joel is the eye of me. The eye of Jesus is the eye of me. The eye of every individual, whether he has attained or has not attained, is the eye of me. And this eye, which is the eye of everyone and the eye of me, is one eye, one self, and that eye, that self, is God expressing. And that is who I am, God expressing. God expressing through the eye of Jesus, through the eye of Joel, through the eye of you, through the eye of everyone, and whoever consciously attunes themselves to this eye finds God expressing perfectly without partiality as infinite grace appearing as. The method won't be improved. It's flawless. We who are willing to work in that method are the laborers in the vineyard. And we reap that grace only when we are in our. Consciously has been stressed again and again by Joel, so remember, consciously in I. Thanks again. I hope you enjoy this spiritual audio. Like, 
share and subscribe for more.